we especially chose that photograph for our heading because in, in, in many ways, in many ways the photograph tells many stories about the history of state secondary education in Victoria. So you may want to ask questions about the picture later. Moving on to the next. Okay, now how did the book come about? Because obviously books are expensive to publish and they take a long time to write. And originally we were commissioned by the History Council of Victoria to write a history of state secondary education in Victoria. Um, so the, the book came about from funding from various organisations such as the Education Department, uh, the Me Bank, as it's known now, um, part of the Me Bank began as a teacher um, bank, teachers bank, back in the 1970s. The history, uh, not the history council, history council commissioned us. Um, the uh, Victorian Institute of Teachers, the AEU, the Teachers Union, and the Pratt Foundation funded about hundred thousand dollars for us to organise teachers and students take over Parliament, which was a weekend of celebrations in Parliament House in 1905, which was 100 years since the Melbourne Continuation School or Melbourne High began. And it was actually Dr Adrian Jones, who chaired the History Council, who thought of the idea of saying, well, let's celebrate 100 years of second state secondary schooling, not just Mac Rob and Melbourne High. And that's what our book's about too. Um, so John and I started together on the book in 2010, and um, I think it's over to John now to talk about his career because we thought it would be interesting to hear a bit about our careers because we didn't really know each other till 2000. So thanks, John. Okay, thank you, Deborah. Uh, thank you for inviting us. And just very briefly, I started off at Ballarat Teachers College doing the old two year trained primary teacher certificate. And, from, and there's a copy of the. Oh, sorry. Uh, I started off. Uh, in 1966 at Ballarat Teachers College doing the Trained Primary Teachers Certificate, which was then a two-year course, uh, and then went on an extension and did my BA at, at, at Monash, majoring in history. Uh, while working, I later completed my PhD in 1989, researching government support for the performing arts in Australia between 1942 and 70. My primary teacher saw me crossing the Great Melbourne Social Divide, the Yarra. From Malvern to Fairfield to Yarra Park to Spencer Street, Clifton Hill to Surrey Hills, back to Wales Street, and finally back up to Hawthorne to Glen Ferry. And despite the socio-economic differences of parents being more or less educated in other areas, the agendas were pretty much the same no matter where you went. And that didn't matter whether you were parents or teachers or students. During that time as a teacher from 1972 to 2005, um, 2002, I did have three periods out of schools. I started off in 81 2 as a coordinator of two different teacher centres providing professional development activities for primary and secondary <coughs> teachers. Then in 1987, I was appointed as one of the two bicentennial education officers developing and promoting related education programs from prep to year 12. And as we used to say then, it was the year of the three C's when you commemorate, celebrate and commiserate. Because it was really the first time when the indigenous issues were become quite public in an educational sense. Then in 1995, the job I'd always wanted came up. They wanted someone to work in humanities curriculum writing programs for schools. So I did that in the humanities, environmental ed, civics and citizenship, and I conceptualised and man managed the Centenary of Federation Education Program for which we received additional funding, and I was able to employ Deborah uh, as the project officer for that particular program, and hence the two of us still stand here today. Uh, so this involves statewide and national curriculum responsibilities uh, in that role. After retiring, I've undertaken further curriculum writing and development projects for the Victorian Curriculum Assessment Authority, the Department of Veterans Affairs, local museums, the Shrine of Remembrance, uh, writing their excursion and outreach programs, which got one, and we won the Small uh, Museums Award for the latter. I also worked with Jacaranda Publishers, 
developing a primary Atlas Teachers Resource Kit, which was shortlisted by the Australian Publishers Association and was later awarded the Australian Geography Teachers Association Award for the best geography uh, resource of the year. As well, I've developed teacher guides for year seven to 10 for history, <coughs> geography, economics, and civics education. And in between that, I've managed somehow to pursue my personal interests, uh, music, theatre, history, cooking, and travel. So I hope I'm a bit more rounded. <laughs> the photo up there is actually the people I work in within Curriculum Branch. And on my left, you can actually see the third person in is Deborah. Um, now, I actually want to put up another photo, which was taken at my retirement uh, function. And Deborah said, no, you look too happy. Um, so uh, we had this one instead. Now, Deborah's going to tell you about her career. So far. So far. So I have called my um, career so far, uh, and you'll probably find out why in a minute. Um, I also did a TPTC at John Teachers College. I also won an extended studentship so I could go on to university and I kept on studying. I got a TPTC, Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Education, Master of Education from Monash and later on I did a PhD which I'll mention a bit later. But um, I did teach in a few primary schools as well and secondary schools and technical schools and I have a, a real love of technical education. So the first photo was of Northcote Tech but more about techs later. Um, when I, uh, I also lectured for a bit at Coburg Teachers <coughs> College on the philosophy <coughs> of education um, and then I joined the Australian Women's Education Coalition in 1976 which was a group of women teachers who met um, after International Women's Year in 1975 and they were interested in implementing a report from the government called Girls School and Society. As a result of that, money was sent to each education department in, in Australia and I was one of the people appointed um, in Australia. I became the coordinator for the elimination of sexism in schools in Victoria in 1977. And that was exciting and scary and the politics was unbelievable. There were deputations to get rid of me and so on. But one of the funny pictures, if I guess it is, is going into to Treasury Place in 1977 was like going into a Charles Dickens novel. There were typing pools, there were hardly any women. Men wore grey cardigans, I'm not kidding. And they saw very senior, and then they had the white shirt and the suit and so on. And many of the women typists refused to type for me because I was a woman, I should be able to type. Uh, now funnily enough, apparently that was very typical. I was just reading a book very recently and it's totally relevant what I'm going to say. It was about women um, detectives in the 1970s and they were expected to type their own reports. The male detectives had their reports typed by the typers. Very common in the 1970s for women not to type for other women. So it's very interesting, the whole idea of sexism and equal opportunity. Eventually the position developed into a unit of, of people. That's just my photo there, but there was about 15 when I left in 1985 for all sorts of reasons, but in 1984 I was the only woman manager of a uh, education unit in the office of the Director General. I was also the youngest manager of a, a unit in the office of the Director General. So you can imagine a lot about what was happening about all of that. I left, I did various other things as a policy advisor in Parliament House. I was executive director of the Australian Agribusiness Education Foundation, never really stayed strayed very much from education. Worked at RMIT as a student advisor for about seven years. And the job that John referred to was advertised, and I thought, oh, I'd love that job. So I went in back into the education department, worked two days a week with John and two days a week in the gender education unit. So the Equal Opportunity Unit, over about 15 years, it developed into the gender education unit. So there I was again. And, um, and then I worked on my PhD and now I actually work just over the park here in the business faculty on gender projects in employment. So um, I think that's possibly enough about me at the moment. So it just shows that we have a divergence of, divergence of, <coughs> divergence of career backgrounds but an ongoing love of history and education and a, a, probably 
if I may say, sort of a real breadth of um, understanding and uh, experience in education. In fact, probably we, we've been alive for more than half of the history of our book. <laughs> and most of that time was in school. So anyway, John. Thank you. And I think one of the other important things is we do have different career pathways, but I think it's also enriched you know, what we've written. If we both come from a curriculum background, for example, then other issues may not have been you know, treated as much. You do need that difference, otherwise you're just in agreement. And we weren't always in agreement, you know, which again meant you end up with a better product. And one of those issues was what to include in the book, and what to call it. Well, deciding upon the content uh, was relatively easy uh, for two people who were familiar with schools and the system and who tend to think globally. And we were both keen to see our special interests covered as comprehensively as uh, space would allow. And as a result, we ended up with an extensive list that not only be, uh, became greater as we decided uh, on how, what we would need to put in. For example, we then decided to put in showcase schools, which and that list also grew along with them. Deborah will talk about those later. Um, and we were going to have a double spread for each uh, decade. And we were going to do all of this in 120 pages. And as you can see, we failed this um, And in, in fact, we cut it back probably to about a third of what it was going to be when we think of all the information we found. Anyway, uh, like all projects, it grew in scope and the page size, and finally took on the structure which you will find in the book. And there are nine sections in that book plus an introduction and a conclusion. The first one is self-explanatory before the Act of 1910, which established secondary education as a formal government responsibility. As Deborah will tell you later, it was already there, but this made it formal. The second, we ask, is it education a government responsibility? We then move on to every uh, student matters, and we examine welfare issues and the impact of changing uh, society on schools. Uh, thus, it considers issues such as the growing range of welfare supports through to the currently accepted practice of integration, multiculturalism, gender, indigenous students, school identity, social life in schools, getting to school, the place of uniforms and supporting those unable to attend a regular school through the correspondent school, and the Distance Education Centre today. Part four, this was going to be, I think, about six or eight pages and end up being about 40-something in the book because it's so central. The changing and responsive curriculum, we ask four important questions. What are the aims and the priorities of education? And they're consistent over time. Governments change, priorities change, projects change, but the aims and priorities don't. What should be taught? How can students best be taught? And how can students best be assessed? As well, we had a number of case studies which showed how the emphasis has changed. So for example, civics and citizenship, which started off with knowing your responsibilities as a citizen, today it's changed to being an informed, active citizen. Uh, from nature study through environmental science and environmental education and ecology, through to sustainability education today. Technologies, how we brought the world into the classroom. The arts, how the range of the arts in some schools uh, seems to cha have changed, though we believe at the moment there's a crisis in music education. Uh, education outside the classroom, which was excursions, field trips, and overseas trips. Sport and physical education, curriculum and professional support from the centre, which grew up, uh, into quite a large organisation by the 1970s and has been uh, disappearing rapidly ever since. The teaching profession, which investigates pre-service uh, training and professional development, the role of the subject associations, inspectors, gender, teacher shortages, principals and their role, and teacher housing. Schools and their communities, and we think of all those people, the mums and the dads, who also make schools operate and happen. Uh, part seven, miles, 
milestones across the decades, which are again self-explanatory, special times such as how schools reacted during war, the role of the royal family, all things British, special events such as exhibitions, the bicentenary and the centenary of federation. You can see a personal bias coming in there. <laughs> uh, government schools, our great school, celebrates the contributions of government education, including a reflection <coughs> on the highlights of uh, secondary education by uh, Meredith's Professor uh, Kwong Lee Dao and a number of other experts who contributed to the book. Uh, yeah, and I think that is what I need. Oh, now the title. The title actually is Secondary Education for All. We were going to call it originally a centenary of snapshots, which you know, now we cringe when we think of the title. Uh, and we came up with that title because in the middle of the big expansion of the 1950s when we had all the migration and the baby boomers, we needed all these schools. And the minister uh, promised, that was Alan, uh, Alfred Shep Shepherd, and the following year the new minister, Bloomfield, they promised a secondary education for all. And of course we asked the question in the book, have we provided a good quality education for all? And we have a compendium called Unlocking the Past, which is a potted history of every school that ever had students in it from year seven and eight and upwards. And then one, one of the questions we also raised was, should, uh, which school should we uh, showcase? And Deborah will now move on and talk about that. Um, all right. Oh. So these are the showcase schools. So each one is a little case study within the book. Uh, some of them were written by a principal or a member of their history um, organisation within the school. But um, I'm going to mention a, a few in particular. As you can see, Matthew Flinders Girls Secondary College is mentioned up there. I don't know, is there anyone here from Geelong or anybody who used to live in Geelong? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, when I was growing up in Geelong, we called it Mally Fleas. But anyway, it's a very interesting school because it actually first opened in 1856 in a beautiful building, which is um, recognised by the National Trust. It was called the Flinders School and it was a national school. So before 1872, a lot of people are surprised to know that the government actually had hundreds of schools. They were called national schools and denominational schools. Matthew Flinders was a national school and I found out many years later that a cousin of ours, because my sister's here, cousin of ours, second or third cousin, actually went there, must have been about a fifth cousin or something, in the 1890s, so anyway, maybe that's the great great uncle. Um, yes, yeah, so when it was also a co ed school, so now it's a girls' school, so it's gone through many incarnations and um, served the community very well. And it now has a waiting list. At one stage, I think in the 1970s, there was talk of closing it, but a very enterprising group of parents got together, kept the school going. Now it has two campuses, and as I said, a waiting list and it's quite famous for all sorts of things, especially for music. Another school I'd like to point out is Northern Bay College, Peter 12. It also has had many incarnations. It's also down in the Geelong area. And I put in 1859, and the reason is, is because it has many campuses now, one of which is the old Corio Primary School. And uh, it is now a, um, what do you call it? A, um, it's a feeder, not a, not a feeder school, it's a, a campus. So the Northern Bay College is actually a campus of about seven schools. So many of the local primary schools or state schools are now um, campuses of Northern Bay College. So it became a high school and there was also a tech, Cryo Tech, which actually began as Northern Tech, then it became Cryo Tech. That school has a very interesting history too and has over 2,000 students. Another interesting one there is the Distance Education Centre, which as you see in the middle, opened in 1909. It started off as a teacher correspondence school, so teachers could upgrade, upgrade their qualifications. For example, when John and I completed our TPTC, we weren't fully qualified. You had to do an extra few years if you wanted to be a principal of subjects, and you often did them through the Distance Education School. Now I think it has about a thousand students enrolled 
um, around Australia from independent and Catholic schools, and I think it offers 40 languages, for example. So it's a very successful school, but as I said, I call it a quiet achiever because many people have never really heard of it. Um, so I, I won't go on about all of those showcase schools because I was also going to show a little joke so we can have a little some principles here. Um, some of the resources that we used, so not only did we have case studies and interview people and we had guests such as Kwong Lee Dow write um, chapters for us, we also went through a hundred years of the Education Gazette and Teachers Aid and also many teacher magazines such as Victorian School News. And this one had a bit of a joke there about um, the principal was getting uh, reading his report, so <laughs> the, the, his secretary. So it's all very gendered in there, isn't it? But anyway, it's, I hope you can think it's funny. <laughs> um, and of course, the very famous Education Gazette and Teachers Aid. John and I spent probably the first six weeks working together, reading every Education Gazette and Teachers Aid. So you can see what we love research, but boy, did we have a laugh. We just left the Education Department, or Department of Education and Training as it's called today and has also had many names over a hundred years and there was a blueprint which we all had to follow this blueprint well apparently there was a blueprint in 1910 <laughs> and there have been many blueprints and, and different ways of looking at how we should present education to students since we read many of these reports but we really loved the Education Gazette it had wonderful uh, photographs in it um, supposed to use the word Bible as a word we understand, but teachers look forward to it every month. I'm sure there's many teachers in here, oh sorry, who looked up their number to see what number they were on the roll and whether or not they could apply for a job, because you have to have a special number. And um, pardon me, you left out the plural apostrophe. Oh, I did too. <laughs> It just shows more heads are better than one. Thank you very much. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, so, but with the education, because the teachers are when it's spelled correctly, it, it was um, somewhere where you found out where friends who you have studied with, where they ended up. It, it also had uh, curriculum in it, it had um, interesting articles, photographs. Um, Funds, for example, that were raised during World War One, World War Two by schools. There was a lot of competition there. And um, anyway, I, I, anyone who can remember the Education Gazette, and John and I just used to laugh our heads off, and and we did take it seriously though, because at one stage it was a very important part of our lives. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. All right, so. Um, and I just I had one other thing, sorry about resources, sorry. Um, the photographs, how can I leave the photographs out? Um, so the book it has about what, 200 photographs in it. Again, that was culled from nearly a thousand photographs. Well, 3,000 and we had a lovely time in the public record office selecting photographs. So we tried very much to make sure that photographs represent all sorts of important things in the book, plus scan the century and you're seeing some of the photographs today. Um, so am I doing the first one? So now this is the Ballarat School of Mines. Please have a look at the date, 1869. And as I think I told you, techs are sort of my thing. Back in 1869, technical schools had boards, and this is a very interesting board, a multicultural board, very reflective of the people who lived in Ballarat at the time. And um, they were mainly self-funded. It wasn't until I think about 1903 or something, the Education Department in Victoria took over technical education. But as you know, technical education is TAFE and RMIT was a tech and, and so on. But this is a very early tech, the Ballarat School of Mines. It was very famous in its day. And it actually enabled students, if they wanted to, to study subjects which got them into university. So, it's one of the many types of schools before 1905, before the Melbourne Continuation School opened, where if you were really enterprising and your parents could support you or you could support yourself, you could study um, subjects, equivalent of leaving subjects, or not, wasn't called matriculation then, to go into university before 1905. 
even a local primary school, many of which, well, they're called state schools, went to year eight. Some of those teachers had university degrees. They could actually coach you, and again, you got entry into university without going to a formal high school. And we wanted to point that out because there's politics everywhere. There's politics back in 1905. The Warrnambool Agricultural High School opened in 1907 and it claims to be the first agricultural high school in Victoria and it still claims that despite the fact that the Ballarat Agricultural and uh, Continuation School started in the same year. Uh, well, the only thing I can think of is perhaps the minister came down and opened Warrnambool before he opened Ballarat and therefore they claimed it. Yet they really both started in the same year. Agricultural high schools were considered to be an important way to promote a scientific approach to farming, but the schools, despite government, state government enthusiasm for them, were not as popular as desired. Many also educated prospective teachers and trained others for the professions. They soon disappeared from the educational scene. Warrnambool was renamed a high school 10 years later in 1917. Ironically, uh, agricultural, anim animal husbandry and horticultural subjects can still be taken today as VCE, VET and VCAL subjects. So some things change and others just stay the same. Um, I have already um, given um, Matthew Flinders quite a bit of justice, but I felt that this was a, such a great photo, a very early photo. You can see the building, and I've actually climbed to the very top, and if you climb to the top of that building, you can see Flinders Peak. Um, and that's important to the school that you can see Flinders Peak, and the girls actually, when they had their centenary, they have a plaque on the top of Flinders Peak at the Yu Yangs, I'm sure you all know where that is. Um, so the Matthew Flinders is, is represented there. And um, as I said earlier, it's a very, very interesting school and its history really covers a, a lot of the history of, of education uh, in Victoria, government school education in Victoria. So to save time, we'll go on to the next one. Uh, this is Hume uh, Central uh, Secondary College, which is uh, out in Broad Meadows. When we were selecting schools, we wanted schools across time. We wanted schools across Victoria and we also wanted different types of schools because there's a range of different types. Now, Hume Central was selected because it opened or was renamed in, 19, in 2007 and it was resulted from the merger of local Broadmeadows high and tech schools that were failing educationally. They used to say that every day hundreds of students in Broadmeadows travel to other areas to better schools. And um, because things were just so bad there, absenteeism, for example, was right. Now, with a super principal appointed, the schools reimagined themselves. They raised the stakes for teachers and students, introduced a uniform and stricter, more consistent discipline, and have shown that when a school and a community work together, educational objectives can be raised and achieved. Today, over 90% complete Year 12. That was in a school which 10, 15 years before was probably lucky if they got 20 or 30% through to BCE. Not bad for a school where absenteeism and disinterest were often rough. The, the photo also shows how the look of classrooms has changed. They're lighter, they're less formal, you have uh, tables instead of desks, and also, uh, if you look closely at the desks, you can see the laptops, not the chalkboard. Big changes from what schools were like in 1910 when the Act was passed. This is, this is one of our very, very favourite photographs. It was in an Education Gazette, but it's also in the three volume history called Vision and Realisation, which I'm sure many of you know about. <laughs> um, that, set, that celebrated um, 1872 to 1972, the Government uh, Education Department. And um, 
this is a wonderful photo. It's a little bit blurry, unfortunately, but this is an early rural school. I don't can't remember the date, but if you look at the clothes and everything, it's probably about the 1880s, 1890s. But it shows the range in ages of the students and the, the wonderful work of the teacher. You can actually see Batavia mentioned up there, which is the old Dutch name for Jakarta. So Australia, you know, Australia is in the middle, and the children are probably representing all different sorts of countries to the north, north of Australia. I think it's the Philippines there on the right, and so on. But um, uh, if you read um, reports of um, which you can again in the old education gazettes, uh, you could read the reports that the principals made of. Um, visiting uh, primary schools or state schools because many of them went to year eight. The amazing work that students did, single uh, teachers went there on their own, um, quite often young women. I don't know if we can see who the teacher is there, but quite often they were young women and, um, and young men who went there, but about 50% of the teachers in rural schools were young women. There was a bit of a joke, I remember, that um, they brought a bit of um, intelligence to the dairy farming community because they stayed there because they were very popular with the local farmers. Anyway, that's a, an aside. <laughs> I mean, one of, the, one of the things about that photo is it's the sort of un, uh, unrecorded extra effort those teachers must have gone to to actually prepare their schoolyard in the way they did for that lesson. They probably took days to get ready to something that took half an hour. This one is another one of the favourite photos. It's from the a flying, I have to be careful saying this, the Flying Fruit Fly Circus School in Wodonga, which this year is 40 years old. And it was established to promote circus skills. It still operates today, being the first of Victoria's uh, curriculum specialist <coughs> schools. Other uh, include the selective uh, entry schools such as Susan Corey, uh, the Gus Nossel High School, Melbourne High School, and McRob Girls High. There are also a number of schools that provide programs for students with special interests and abilities, such as the Victorian College for the Arts and music specialist schools, including McKinnon, McLeod, Blackburn, Mill Park, and University High. Maribyrnong Secondary, which has specialises in physical education and academic excellence, the John Monash Science School and the Science and Math Centres, of which there are six throughout the state. They've all played an important role catering for you know, the students with these special interests. Uh, so, so, sort of a favourite photograph. We found many photographs showing very young women uh, going about what was called housewifery or domestic arts or domestic science. Very early on it was called housewifery. They had to get, learn how to do laundry. Um, there was actually, actually if you lived in the city and some of the bigger rural centres such as Geelong and Ballarat, there were actually uh, cookery centres and there were woodwork centres. So boys in years seven and eight and girls went away from the usual school, state school, and they spent full time working on um, their seem, seem to be appropriate uh, learnings. Um, I think what's important though is that many of the uh, schools, there were about 20 secondary schools that were called domestic arts high school when they began. Um, so one of the incarnations of Matthew Flinders was that it was a domestic arts college. But so was Canterbury Girls High School. Now Canterbury Girls High School, again, is another seen as an elite academic school with a waiting list. It began as a domestic arts college where girls virtually did full-time housework, cookery, needlework. <coughs> and another one was uh, Preston Girls. Um, can't think of a, 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 some, oh, uh, Fitzroy, yeah. Which is now Coward High School. Um, there's one down near. Hmm? Yeah, thanks, J.H. Boyd. There was a 20 at one stage. Mentone. Now, Mentone's still there, sorry. It's also an academic high school with a waiting list for girls. So these, all these schools began as domestic arts colleges, but, but what is very interesting is they enabled women who weren't allowed to be principals of co-ed high schools, even if they had degrees or PhDs. There were a couple of women who had PhDs in education very early on. They could only be principals of girls' high schools. So this gave them 
a promotion opportunity. So there's always interesting stories if you delve into it. <laughs> Uh, by the mid-1980s, the idea of integration was being implemented in government schools. Uh, concepts about student welfare had expanded since 1910, when the sole services were the school medical and dental services, established to cater for students up to year eight, which was the final year of compulsory education. This was effectively the only welfare support provided for regular classrooms, those schools for the deaf, the blind, and then called mentally handicapped existed. They focused on what students did not know rather than what they could do. Uh, and a, a friend just sent me one from one of the showcase schools, Emerson, which is a special school. And I thought, if you took out all the pages of showing things students today do, and went back to the criteria from 1910, you'd have to rip out most pages in their yearbook because the students would not have been thought capable of doing all these things they're achieving today. And this is a marked uh, contrast to today where physical, emotional, psychological and social health have been addressed, especially since World War II. Integration required modifications uh, for students such as these to many school buildings and without specially trained teachers they relied upon the goodwill of regular classroom teachers and teachers aides to succeed. That became a considerable further commitment from those teachers involved in the program as they learned to work with these students who had previously not been in regular schools. It's important to note that integration has not replaced the special schools but it provides an alternative setting for those students for whom it's appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're looking at the time and we realise that to get through some of our other things we're going to have to be very quick. So this, the next one is teacher training which we really can't leave out. Um, John mentioned earlier about curriculum. Well the Graduate School of Education building down there used to be the curriculum centre, full of teachers and filmmaking people and so on. But this is a very early photo of the Teachers College taken out in front of the 1888 building up on the corner there. And in 1917, probably about half of those students were doing university subjects or dip ed, because from 1905 you could do a dip ed. Melbourne University was the first university to offer a diploma of education. And uh, studentships were offered and of course later on in the 1970s studentships were incredibly generous and thousands and thousands of young people um, studied to become teachers. In fact Monash University apparently for its first five years most of its funding came from um, studentship holders. It was actually based on teacher training. <laughs> but anyway, um, that's again reading between the lines. This photo was introduced to show that by the 1970s we were thinking outside the classroom. These students are up at Listerfield National Park for a forestry uh, field trip and of course and since then uh, the opportunities have grown. Not only do those students go to Listerfield today, they go to countries throughout the world. That's, that's how the opportunities have grown. We had again this interesting photo, we just loved it because this is uh, young women at Swinburne University who, or the TAFE section who get the opportunity to go to university or to TAFE to get a qualification and take their children with them. <coughs> what you may not know is in Victoria, for example, about a thousand girls between the age of 12 and 18 give birth to babies. Now if you think about it, how does that affect their, their futures? Of course some of them get married and so on. but. How do we cater for these young women? I don't think we do a very good job, but every now and again there's isolated examples of this. So we wanted to show this as a positive photo of changing attitudes and developing opportunities. Uh, this was a favourite program of mine where each year we would conduct um, 
constitutional conventions at the local, state and national level for year 10 to 12 students who would come to discuss issues that arise out of the Australian Constitution. It sounds very dry and boring, but when you get the students together talking about should we be a republic, do we need a Bill of Rights, what do we do about refugees, the debates become extremely heated. Uh, and fortunately that program still continues today. And we just can't leave parents and school councils out. Um, we mentioned some of the schools very early on, such as Ballarat High. 50% of the funding for Ballarat High came from the local community, parents in particular, and they continue to support these schools throughout the lives of these schools um, by working bees and raising money. Um, Frankston High, for example, um, Shepparton High, if you look at the histories of these schools, they were all begun by local communities and parents raising money and even giving land, farmers giving land, local business people giving land. Um, in the Victorian government system, it is very dependent on parents and the school community to fund schools and make sure the students have resources. Well, you, uh, when most of us started school, there would have been very few students from non-Anglo-Celtic backgrounds. It would be possible to go through uh, your, our school days meeting only but a handful of new Australians. Think of how the situation has changed, but also the support that's been provided through uh, such things as ESL, English as a Second Language Teaching, through the language centres where students now can undergo a six months in, month uh, <coughs> intensive course learning uh, uh, English and therefore being able to function in regular classrooms. As well, the curriculum has changed from a very br uh, British centred uh, curriculum where we probably learnt more about British and European history than we did about Australian. Uh, to know, and the same with languages, you learn French and German. Today, there are 26 lobes which are taught uh, for uh, the VCE. Um, and we now have multicultural perspectives showing how um, you know, people from a whole range of cultures have impacted on uh, our own society and our own culture. This was just showing Coburg, and you can think back to some of those photos earlier, like right? Matthew Flinders and uh, Warrnambool. Everyone was standing at a very straight, still, formally arranged. Now the school is a far more relaxed learning environment. And in 1922, government schools celebrated 50 years of publicly funded education. Here students marched down Swanston Street. Local schools uh, will still uh, participate in local uh, parades and festivals. Uh, seeing this as an opportunity to promote and celebrate their own school. In 1920, sorry, 2022, it will be 150 years since free, secondary, uh, sorry, secular and compulsory education was introduced in Victoria. We wonder what celebrations will be held in that year. Thank you. Thank you.